Good morning. Thank you for joining us this morning. My name is Erica Perrell, and I'm the Communications Manager at APEC. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging while we're gathering virtually this morning, we are all on lands which are the traditional and unceded territory of various First Nations. Uh, with their relatively young and fast growing population, Indigenous workers can play a very important role in helping address labor challenges across the region. We'll discuss that a little bit later on today. Uh, we're also undertaking some current research on how Indigenous firms and communities can best contribute to and benefit from future economic growth in the Atlantic region. You're probably joining us this morning after reading one or maybe all of our recent reports in our Finding Talent series, uh, assessing both the current and future skills uh, issues in Atlantic Canada. The most recent report, which was actually just released this week, examines five overarching trends and how they may affect the future of work in Atlantic Canada. The forthcoming reports uh, in that series will take a deeper dive into some select industries. And all of these reports are available on our website in both French and English. While you're on that website, um, checking out the reports, make sure that you sign up to receive email updates. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. That's the easiest way to sort of stay up to date on our latest research and, and other events. A couple of quick notes before we get started today on today's presentations. Uh, one, yes, you can get a copy of today's presentation. That's usually one of the first questions that people have. A PDF of the presentation is actually already available on the event webpage, so you can check that out. Um, there will also be a recording of the session available later today. I always say, I, I promise by tomorrow morning, it depends on how technology cooperates, uh, but we will email you a link uh, to that recording tomorrow morning. So anybody who's registered for the session will get a link to the recording and the presentations as well. Uh, at the end of today's webinar, uh, we will post an evaluation survey link so that you can let us know how it went. It just takes a minute, I promise, uh, and to complete that, and we do really appreciate the feedback. Uh, and also, finally, as, as you're listening this morning, if you think of any questions at any point in time, just pop them in the chat uh, as you think of them. You know, No need to sort of hold them until the end. Uh, once we once we finish the presentations, we'll do our best to answer any of your questions during the Q&A period. Uh, I would now like to welcome APEX President and CEO, David Shandy, who is hosting and moderating today's session. Welcome, David. Thank you, Erica, and welcome everyone again to this morning's session. We are very glad that you're able to join us. Uh, this is a very important topic. Um, when we talk to businesses and other organizations around the region, the whole issue around skills and talent shortages, uh, it was an issue before COVID, where we had a major disruption to our labor market during COVID. Uh, and now as we come out of that, uh, it's quickly come back on the agenda. And that's why we've been undertaking some research over this past year that you see that Eric has already mentioned uh, and this webinar uh, and we'll have some other reports coming out as we finish uh, those uh, reports. So again, uh, we hope to be able to answer some of your questions to help you understand what's really going on today uh, in our labor markets and how we might respond to that. And so to uh, articulate this and to present uh, some of the findings from my research, I've got two of my senior team joining us this morning. Uh, Patrick Brannan is our senior a researcher from APEC. Uh, he has been with APEC many years and you will uh, hear him speaking uh, a little later in May and June when we host our major projects webinars and you can register for those events as well. Uh, and uh, you see there the dates of that. So I encourage you to sign up for those. Uh, they are paid uh, webinars, but uh, we're staying online just because of uh, the timing of announcements of when restrictions were easing. So uh, please check that out on our website. Uh, we'll be happy to tell you what we think is happening on the investment side. So that's a big part of Patrick's responsibilities, but he's also very involved in our labor market research. And joining him to present this morning is also Lana Asaf. Uh, she joined us earlier this year as a senior economist, having spent a career in the federal and provincial governments. And she's quickly uh, jumped in to help us as we complete uh, this research on labor markets. So those are your two presenters today. Uh, I will be uh, fielding questions to them on different topics. And you can see here on the, the next slide, the outline of the topics we want to talk about. Uh, we do want to look at, you know, why do we have these issues? What is the evidence? Where are we seeing the biggest pressures? And most importantly, kind of what do we do about them? So that's the agenda for today. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Lana, I'd like to pose kind of the first topic to you as we look at this. Uh, and again, there will be time for questions as we go through this. But Lana, 
uh, everyone's or most employers are experiencing shortages. What's going on? Why are so many people facing challenges in terms of finding workers this, uh, at this time? Great, thanks David. So I'll start speaking to that. There are several factors causing labor shortages in our region, which are shown on this slide. Some of these have been affected by COVID-19 in short term or some more permanent ways. As I go through the causes, I'll point out a few examples of potential long lasting effects that we're currently monitoring. So first and the most important driver of a region's labor challenges is demographics. For decades, we've been experiencing slow population growth due to low birth rates, out migration of young people and low immigration. We also have an aging workforce with more people retiring than entering the labor market. Several potential supply factors are also contributing to our labor issue. For example, a lack of graduates from certain trades and university programs, such as computer sciences, has impeded filling some entry-level jobs. During the pandemic, many individuals decided to delay their schooling. Therefore, this trend could be accentuated going forward. Another supply factor is retention of immigrant workers. While this is improving, it has been low in the past, with many immigrants choosing to live in urban centers. Changes in labor demand are an important role as well. There have been structural shifts in various Atlantic industries over the years. Demand has been growing in some areas, like finance and science, while declining in others, like manufacturing. Across almost all industries, however, we see that technology advances have increased the demand for skilled labor. COVID-19 um, accelerated this trend and has led to demand outpacing supply for cybersecurity and other IT professions. We have also seen geographic shifts where labor demand has grown faster in larger urban areas than in smaller rural communities. Now, last but not least, some regional economic factors may be to blame, such as historically low wages and higher taxes. While our housing prices have been relatively low, the housing market is now tight in many parts of the region. And this is partly due to um, increased immigration from uh, other provinces during the pandemic. So labor shortages can have serious negative impacts, not just on affected firms, but on the whole economy. At the firm level, reduced production and service disruptions can occur to a shortage of staff with needed skills. Lower profit margins can result from increased costs because of more overtime pay, higher wages, or outsourcing work. Human resource challenges could arise from mental health pressures, high employee turnover, and a loss of knowledge if workers leave without succession planning. If these issues become widespread across industries, they will unfortunately lead to bigger macroeconomic problems. For example, inflationary pressures can occur from supply chain disruptions or businesses increasing prices to fund higher wages. Slower GDP growth can happen if firms put off investments and expansions or move to other jurisdictions where labor is available. Also, lower labor productivity may be observed as new workers are continually trained and brought up to speed. Thank you, Lana. So at this point, we'd actually like to uh, hear from you. Uh, we've got a couple of polls in this session that we would like to ask. And the first question is around, uh, for your organization, how severe are the labor shortages uh, that you are facing? Uh, and you can just click on your response, whether they're severe, moderate, mild, or you're not experiencing shortages. Uh, so for your organization, for your industry, uh, for the sector that you're involved in, can you just give us your quick uh, response in terms of how big of an issue uh, are you facing in terms of attracting and retaining talents? Uh, so we're seeing those responses come in quite quickly. So I just I give you a little more time to get those responses in. Appreciate the participation here. So I'll just give you a few more seconds. Responses are just starting to slow down, but we've got how many of you participated. All right, so I'm just gonna close the poll there and share the results of this that you can hopefully see on your screen. Uh, so again, I think when we look at this, the, the overwhelming majority, 90% of you are saying, yes, we are experiencing some measure of labor shortages. Uh, about a quarter of you are saying they're severe, um, but you know, 75% or so uh, are saying, look, these are, you know, 70% are saying, you know, they're severe or moderate. So again, you're seeing differences across sectors, and I think uh, you'll see some of that reflected uh, in our analysis as we continue. So, uh, Patrick, um, this is kind of what we're seeing from our uh, poll. Uh, it's certainly a serious issue. We've certainly heard a lot of anecdotal reports. Uh, so what can you tell us? Like, is there some real evidence behind all these reports and kind of the survey results we've just seen today? 
Yeah, David, definitely, uh, you know, prior to COVID-19, uh, a number of surveys, including some of our own research, was pointing to, uh, you know, some of the challenges around labor and, and recruitment, uh, including our digital study in, in 2019, digital firms, about a little over half uh, cited labor as the main obstacle to growth, uh, as well, our nonprofit uh, report for Nova Scotia, and just before the start of the pandemic, about 40% uh, were seeing uh, recruiting labor as a significant challenge. Uh, and then things changed <clears throat> very quickly in March, and uh, the pandemic caused a, a massive disruption to our labor markets, a uh, very large, rapid decline in employment. And then we had a you know relatively uh, quick recovery compared to some uh, recessions or downturns. Uh, so the region has regained most of the jobs uh, during the early stages that were lost during the early stages of the pandemic, uh, but certain industries still are lagging, like tourism and, uh, and accommodations and, and food and restaurants. Uh, more recent surveys have shown that the uh, those labor shortages that have continued and actually have picked up a bit. Uh, BDC's September report from last fall, 55% uh, of Atlantic Canadian companies were struggling with hiring. Uh, more recently, uh, CFIB study said that about 60% of Atlantic Canada's small businesses are facing labor shortages. When we look at the data, it's also showing a, a growing problem on the labor front. Uh, on the left slide, we're looking at the vacancy rate, which is the share of current positions that are vacant as a percent of total jobs. Uh, that is climbing in Atlantic Canada prior uh, to the pandemic. It was you know, going from about 2% to 3%. Uh, and more recently, in the last half of 2021, 20, uh, uh, over 4.5%, close, close to 5 in PEI and Nova Scotia. Uh, nationally, the vacancy rate is about 5.4%, so it's 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 up there with the national rate. Uh, the number of job vacancies increased from about 28,000 in 2019 to about 45,000 by the fourth quarter of last year. Uh, also important on the right-hand side there in the red, uh, we see that many jobs are going unfilled longer. Uh, so we're looking at here uh, hard-to-fill job vacancies. So here over 60 days, uh, the share of those jobs that are vacant or over 60 days is climbing rapidly more than doubling from about 23% in uh, 2019 to about 49% by the end of last year. Um, contributing to this labor market tightness, we are seeing unemployment rates falling in Atlantic Canada. The unemployment rate back in the early 90s was about 15% across the region. Uh, now it's about 8% as of early 2022. Uh, there's more analysis on the impact of some of these factors on the data side on our uh, website and Erica is gonna link uh, the latest report that we did on uh, labor shortage data um, on, our, uh, on the chat, in the chat uh, momentarily. Another sign that uh, we're facing labor shortages, we're seeing uh, increased migration into the region. People often move for job opportunities. Uh, that's why Atlantic Canada has lost so many young people, especially in recent decades to other parts of Canada. Uh, the booming oil sector contributed to workers moving to, and commuting to Alberta for work. Uh, that effect has faded as things have slowed down there. And between 2016 and 2019, there were some modest inflows, especially to the maritime provinces. Uh, in Newfoundland and Labrador, a bit of a different story. You see the blue bar, the blue line there. They had a dip uh, between 2016 and 2019 because a lot of major project activity was starting to wind down and people left after all that construction took place. Uh, but during the pandemic, we saw um, a huge surge, especially in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, of people coming from other parts of, of Canada, especially Ontario. Uh, a net of 22,000 people moved into the region uh, in 2021. Uh, but the challenge is uh, not all of those migrants are going to help solve the labor force challenge because some of them may be still working in Ontario, say, and living here. But uh, the, the influx certainly is making some difference in terms of our labor force. Uh, uh, immigration on the right-hand side, you see a similar kind of trend. Uh, it was growing prior to the pandemic, uh, thanks to the Atlantic Immigration Program and the Provincial Nominee Program, uh, increased from about 8,300 in 2015 to about 18,000 in 2019. Uh, that dropped during the pandemic due to travel restrictions, uh, reduced processing capacity, uh, but immigration bounced back last year very strongly to 19,000 into the region, and that was a record for Atlantic Canada. Retaining these uh, migrants is, is critical. Uh, the region has to ensure that it can uh, provide sufficient housing, healthcare, and other infrastructure and public services that newcomers are going to need. 
Thank you, Patrick. So that's a good sense of some anecdotal evidence and surveys, but also some hard data that are consistent with some of these trends and reports that we're getting. So that's at the aggregate level. When we look at industries, occupations in different regions, are we, are we seeing this across the board or the specific areas that are facing greater pressures than others? Yeah, there's a, a few areas I can point to. Uh, you know, labor markets do vary substantially across Atlantic Canada. We have unemployment rates that are much higher in rural areas than there are in the uh, cities. Uh, most of our growth in recent years has been in unemployment and labor supply has been happening in, in urban areas. Uh, immigration is largely focused on in urban areas. We do expect that to continue um, over the next 20 years or so through our projection model that we have. Uh, we do expect declines in overall labor supply outside the top six cities in, in Atlantic Canada. So in the chart here, we're looking at vacancy rates comparing 2015 to most recent quarter in 2021. And uh, very clearly, uh, there's an increasing issue across Atlantic Canada in every, in every economic region. Um, one thing we do notice that the vacancy rates uh, are higher in some uh, rural areas of Atlantic Canada, rural New Brunswick, rural Nova Scotia had the highest rate uh, job vacancy rates at the moment. Uh, there are overall a similar number of job vacancies in, in urban and rural areas, but the growth rate over the last few years has been stronger uh, in, in rural areas, up 62% compared to 36% growth in job vacancies in urban uh, areas of Atlantic Canada. Uh, looking at uh, Industry breakdown, uh, we do see again uh, quite different results in terms of job vacancies. Here, our chart is looking at the job vacancy rate on the bottom axis, average wages on the left in the scatter plot. Um, and it does show that average wages do have an impact. Those industries that are lower wage tend to have greater uh, job vacancy rates. Uh, the accommodation of food sector really stands out. It's 12% of its jobs are currently vacant uh, due to a lot of it due to the impact of the pandemic, a lot of opening and closings, uh, people shifting for, away from that sector because of the uncertainty in, in employment, uh, looking for more secure employment. Uh, similarly, other services, such as a lot of uh, personal services were impacted by a lot of closures, retail, same kind of, same kind of thing that we're seeing there. Uh, construction, uh, transportation vacancy rates are also high due to labor availability challenges. Uh, the one higher wage industry that we have highlighted here is professional services, which includes IT workers, uh, which are in high demand due to increased uh, digitalization over the last two years. And looking at how things are different by occupation, some of the occupations that are really in demand, uh, again, reinforcing the uh, uh, concern that most of the job postings are at lower wages, but seven of the top 10 here are um, have an average or medium wage of under $20 an hour. A few of them are only slightly higher than minimum wage, but the, the, the number of job postings that are led by uh, retail salespersons, about 1,500 of them, are currently open and not filled in Atlantic Canada. Uh, similarly to other industries that were hit hard during the pandemic, a lot of people have left the sector and are, are looking for other opportunities with some more uh, job security. Uh, it was the occupation with most postings in, in Newfoundland and Labrador and New Brunswick. Uh, other retail positions are also quite high on the, on the list of uh, job openings. A uh, close second on our list was uh, on the list was uh, registered nurses. Uh, the top occupation for job postings in Nova Scotia and PEI, home support workers, nurses aid positions also fairly high on the list of, uh, of people that have uh, jobs that are currently uh, vacant. And we know that the the, the stresses and strains that nurses have been under uh, during the pandemic. Several occupations listed on the table are important to restaurants, hotels, uh, transportation industry, and office support as well. Thank you, Patrick. So again, that gives us a good sense of where some of those pressures are. But I, I noticed you talked about accommodations and you flagged some of those uh, other positions there on the occupation list that some of these are very seasonal industries. So it's not just full year jobs. Uh, we know we've got a fairly high degree of seasonality in the region. How does that play out uh, in this region? And is that kind of contributing to some of the labor pressures we're seeing? Any thoughts on that, Patrick? Yeah, the uh, discussion on seasonal industries is very important uh, because they're, the traditional labor force for these industries is expected to decline. They're uh, likely to face labor challenges because they rely on a workforce that's generally uh, fairly old or fairly young, uh, older workers in the primary sector, construction, 
uh, younger workers in accommodation and food and, and tourism. These are all seasonal uh, types of industries. Older workers are going to be retiring and we have fewer young people entering the labor force at the moment. So it's going to be a challenge for seasonal uh, industries and, and companies that rely on seasonal workers. Uh, we do have more seasonal employment in Atlantic Canada uh, than nationally, about 86,000 seasonal workers in 2019. Uh, there's lower employment in the winter months in, in Atlantic Canada than the summer months. And that seasonal variation that I'm talking about here is that uh, difference between the trough in the winter and the peak in the summer months. And uh, seasonal employment has been falling. Uh, you know, it's, it was quite higher, uh, quite a bit higher in, uh, in previous years, but still remains quite high in PEI, rural parts of New Brunswick and Newfoundland and Labrador especially. Um, so in this chart, we're looking at the seasonal variation in employment. So the peak to trough percentage change in employment uh, on the bottom axis. And on the, on the left side, we're looking at the, the number, the volume of seasonal workers in those industries. And what you'll notice is that the green dots there, the primary sector, very seasonal uh, in terms of their variation in employment. 70% um, for fishing, 40% for agriculture and forestry. Those are the three highest in the region. Uh, but in terms of volume, they're, they're not massive. It's about 15,000 jobs combined. Uh, conversely, construction, which is about 30% seasonality employment, has about 22,000 seasonal workers. Tourism industry is also uh, quite seasonal. You see the yellow dots there, accommodation of food, info culture, recreation uh, industries, uh, certainly very seasonal. And they're likely to see some increased pressures, uh, you know, this summer as tourism operations uh, scale up to welcome more national and international uh, visitors. Manufacturing also fairly seasonal, but really that's focused on seafood processing. Uh, the other parts of manufacturing are not that seasonal, but seafood processing certainly is. And then we talk about seasonality, we have to talk about uh, EI as well. Um, there's a strong reliance on employment insurance uh, by seasonal workers. EI tends to move counter cyclically uh, with seasonal employment. So as the number of people that are uh, that are employed in Atlantic Canada falls by about 60,000 between August and December, uh, we see the number of initial EI claims increasing by about 20,000. And that seasonal variation in EI claims in Atlantic Canada is about 30% higher than it is nationally, but still a lot better than it was in the, in the 90s when we were about twice as high as uh, the rest of the country. Uh, that income support function has really become ingrained and entrenched among individuals that, uh, and communities that rely on seasonal industries. And, uh, you know, we have a demographics that are changing. It's, it is time to have another look at the EI system and how it can support the labor force. Uh, but we have to make sure that it's uh, carefully considered so it doesn't amplify uh, current labor shortages. And there's more on EI and seasonality uh, on our report on seasonality that uh, we'll post in the chat as well. Thank you, Patrick. That gives us a good overview of where the pressures are, the different dimensions when we look at our labor markets right now and how these labor shortages uh, come into play. Uh, so this is kind of where we are. This is where we've been in some of the recent trends. Um, but as we look forward, we need to be mindful of what's coming uh, down uh, down the pipe, as it were. So, Lana, can you talk a bit about kind of how are some of the future trends going to impact the future of work and our labor markets in this region? Yeah, absolutely. So we want to highlight um, five key themes that are influencing the work in Atlanta, or future work in Atlantic Canada. These are all discussed in our latest report within this Finding Talent series, and I believe Erica is posting a link to that in the chat. So in these next few slides, I'll provide a brief overview of each theme. First off is demographics. It's the main driver of labor market changes within our region. As mentioned earlier, we have an aging population. In 2020, there are only seven younger workers in the job market for every 10 retirees. You can see in the graphic, we don't expect the statistics to be really changed within Atlantic Canada for at least the next couple of decades. Unless more people move here or a higher portion of the existing population participates in the labor market, we project that our labor force will shrink by 130,000 by 2040. One way to avoid this scenario would be to increase the participation rate of older workers. We estimate that every five percentage point increase in their participation rate could add 24,000 people to today's workforce. Another solution is to increase immigration. We estimate that this region needs to retain an average of 13,000 to 16,000 immigrants per year to support our labor force needs. Considering that retention rates are not 100%, initially we'll have to attract more than these production numbers. 
Urban and rural areas are experiencing labor supply challenges, but the situation is more dire in rural communities. Oldest workforces in the region are found in smaller communities. Improving diversity and inclusion in the labor market, social and economic imperative. Increasing employment of underrepresented groups and immigration will be critical to generating long-term change in our labor market. Fortunately, Edge Canada is expected to welcome a growing number of immigrants. This will likely lead to greater population diversity, given that about 75% of Atlantic immigrants between 2011 and 2016 were visible minorities. As shown in the graph, by 2040, we estimate that visible minorities will be between 15 and 17% of our population, which is up um, from 4% 4 in 2016. Providing employment opportunities to underrepresented groups has measurable benefits. Labor force participation rate for women in Atlantic Canada is currently seven percentage points lower than that of men. Increasing the female participation rate to be on par with men will provide an additional 71,000 workers in this region. The $10 a day daycare is definitely a big step in this direction. Atlantic Canada's indigenous population is relatively young and fast growing, as was mentioned earlier by Eric. We estimate that reducing the unemployment rate for um, Indigenous workers to that of non-Indigenous persons would add about 4,000 workers. We also estimate that increasing the participation rate for persons with disabilities could help fill our labor gap. Every five percentage point increase would lead to about 18,000 new employees in Atlanta, Canada. Automation and digitalization can be effective responses to labor shortages. Automating routine intensive tasks costs some jobs to disappear, but others will be created. As digitalization increases, the type of available jobs and in-demand skill sets will continue to evolve. However, Atlantic Canada is not reaching its potential in terms of gains from technology improvements. The graph on this slide illustrates that firms in our region lag the rest of the country in adopting technology. Smaller average firm size is one underlying factor of this phenomenon. Lack of workers with appropriate skills and thus the need to reskill employees are other important barriers. Remote work is something that many people um, became familiar with due to COVID-19. A 2021 Canadian survey on business conditions so that 25% of Atlantic businesses plan to have some employees continue to telework after the pandemic. The permanence of remote work impacts the future of work via many channels. This includes things like changes in physical office space, geographical distribution of workers, and human resource practices. With the ability to live and work almost anywhere, there will be greater competition for workers. However, allowing for telework also presents an opportunity for Atlantic businesses to fill positions requiring experiences or requiring experience that cannot be found in the region. Transition to net zero emissions will create major structural changes. It will affect established industries and also create new green jobs. Traditional energy industries like oil and gas are anticipated to gradually phase out or undergo significant transformation as we shift towards more renewable sources. The economics forecasts that up to 75% of Canadian workers in oil and gas could be displaced by 2050. Newfoundland and Labrador is particularly at risk with about 3,900 employees in its offshore oil industry in 2020. New Brunswick is also home to Canada's largest oil refinery, which employs over 1,600 people. Building and construction accounted for 37% of global energy CO2 emissions in 2020. This implies that a massive shift in the industry will be needed to achieve net zero buildings. Although perhaps less quantifiable at this time, the green transition will likely impact other key Atlantic industries, including agriculture, fishing, and aquaculture. Essentially, any carbon intensive industry will have to change its operations. In terms of new green jobs, sectors directly connected to environmental sustainability are bound to boom. Between 2019 and 2025, Canada projects that environmental employment in Canada will grow 17%, and there will be over 6,500 net jobs in Atlantic Canada. However, the transition to a greener economy has labor market risks and challenges. According to Conference Board of Canada, transition from automated, automation vulnerable to green jobs is predicted to be especially challenging in most Atlantic provinces. New green jobs may also be difficult to fill. Many experts are predicting a divergence in the demand and supply of individuals with the required skill sets. So Atlantic Canada is a small region dependent on exports. Um, some businesses are revaluing their logistics to insulate themselves from future disruptions to supply chains um, or experience during the pandemic. 
This could have some positive and negative outcomes. Shifting to local higher cost suppliers may undermine competitiveness for exporters, but it could create opportunities for other regional firms. Atlantic exporters may also lose contracts as international clients switch to suppliers in their own market. At the same time, the public sector has been investing to expand supply chain capacity at the ports of Halifax and St. John. These investments are expected to create jobs. The private sector is expanding logistics capacity within our region too. For example, Amazon recently opened a distribution center in Nova Scotia. We expect that the growth of e-commerce will continue, which could increase the number of positions needed in warehouses and local delivery. Another important global risk um, that we're monitoring is rising protectionism in major trading partners like the US and China. Greater trade restrictions could lead more Atlantic firms to invest in operations and distribution partners in the foreign rather than local markets. Well, thank you, Lana. So we talked about uh, some of the current issues. Uh, Lana, you've talked about some of the other trends that are going to impact our labor markets as we go forward in terms of the number of jobs and the skills required. Um, so we really want to now talk about uh, solutions. What do we do about that? So before I ask uh, my team, uh, we would just like to get your input uh, in terms of what you are doing in your business, your industry, uh, your area like for you what has been or what is or what do you hope will be the most effective solution uh, many of you will be doing a number of these uh, but if you can just share kind of what has been or what is the most effective solution is it around wages the non-wage benefits uh, recruiting internationally automating greater training or do you have other strategies kind of not referenced here so again if you could just I take a few seconds to share your results. So the poll again is anonymous. We only see the aggregate results. So I just encourage you to quickly think about that and click on the screen uh, according to your vote. So we've got just over half of you. I'll just give you a few more seconds to uh, record your vote here and then we'll share the results. All right, just last few seconds for those of you still looking to vote. All right, so I'm gonna close the poll there and share the results with you so you can see the results of that on your screen. Uh, and interestingly, uh, we often talk about wages, why not firms raise wages? Well, you know, a quarter of you are saying you know, that is the most important strategy, but it's interesting here, uh, the emphasis on looking at non-work uh, wage benefits and arrangements uh, is actually uh, ranked more important. Again, recruiting internationally, automation, training, and other solutions, but certainly the focus is here on how do I ensure a high paid job and a job that people want to work with for other reasons. So that's certainly what uh, our poll is saying here. Uh, so Lana, as I uh, stop sharing those results, uh, can you just walk us through what we see or what you see as some of the potential solutions uh, for how firms and other employers can respond uh, to these shortages and pressures? Yeah, so there are many ways to tackle our labor challenge with solutions varying in effectiveness depending on the industry. As shown here in the slide, we have created a list of key practical solutions that fall under four focus areas. So labor supply initiatives are all about maximizing the pool of available workers in our region. This include reforming EI to increase supply of your labor, increasing um, a labor market participation of underrepresented groups, attracting and retaining international workers and temporary foreign workers, and improving social infrastructure, like for example, housing, transportation, high-speed internet. This factor is particularly important in rural communities. Labor demand solution helps with shortages because greater investment in automation can reduce labor requirements while improving competitiveness. Skills development initiatives highlight that the issue isn't just about the number of people, but also quality of workers with right knowledge and skills. Addressing this area requires enhancing education and literacy outcomes and offering more training opportunities that are tailored for the skill set. Training programs could be done internally through colleges, universities, or private organizations. Market alignment refers to how we can ensure that labor supply and demand are better aligned with one another. Two solutions in this regard are improving labor market information and coordination for better job matching, also providing sufficient monetary and non-monetary benefits to attract and retain workers. For example, higher wages, tailored benefit packages, or more flexible work arrangements. 
better understand how the labor force challenges vary between industries, skilled research and for industries with different challenges and technological reasons. We selected accommodations, seafood processing, advanced manufacturing, and digital. These industries each have unique characteristics, vary in wage levels, skill levels, full year versus seasonal employment, and urban versus rural labor markets. Almost all solutions mentioned in the previous slide are part of these industries. However, this slide hones in on the three that we were assessed to be the most effective through our research. I'll go over accommodations and seafood, and then I'll hand it over to Pat for the other two. So first off, accommodations. Number one um, identified solution here has to do with temporary foreign workers. Hiring temporary foreign workers can help address the seasonal peaks in the accommodations industry. Recent policy changes to the temporary foreign worker program will allow sectors with labor shortages, such as accommodations, better access these workers. One change is that for the next year, 10% cap on low wage temporary foreign workers has been increased to 30%. Also, accommodations companies are now able to apply for low wage workers, even if they're in an area where unemployment rate is greater than 6%. The second solution is underrepresented groups. The accommodations industry could benefit from greater participation of underrepresented groups. As there are many small operators, industry associations can help employers find ways to connect with these groups and become an employer of choice. This may also require steps to increase enrollment of these groups in hospitality or other related programs. Third is international workers. International students are another source of labor that could be expanded for part-time or seasonal positions. Colleges and employers could collaborate to recruit students to work in the industry while studying a degree. Nova Scotia's occupations and demand immigration stream is a great example of promoting immigration targeted at key occupations. The Nova Scotia program allows businesses to access foreign workers quicker and lower skill occupations. It also gets rid of the need for a labor market impact assessment. So moving on to seafood processing, the number one solution here is, has to do with automation. There's potential for more automation in this industry, which could help reduce labor requirements. Technology levels for this industry in Canada have unfortunately fallen behind um, that of many other countries. Governments should ensure that the investment environment is conducive to automation. Processors have indicated that there is insufficient financial support for seafood processing innovation. Second solution has to do with EI reform. As Patrick mentioned earlier, and as we articulated in a recent report, we need to re-examine the role of EI in terms of seasonal employment. Processors, along with employers and in other industries, have identified EI as a major barrier to hiring the workers that they need. This, of course, needs careful analysis and consideration due to various implications for firms, individuals, and communities. However, we do need an EI program that works for our current and coming labor market realities. Third is temporary foreign workers. Seafood processing is a seasonal industry, and therefore temporary foreign workers are an ideal source of labor to fill gaps during busy times. Recent adjustments to the temporary foreign worker program will help seasonal industries like seafood processing access workers more easily. As part of these changes, there will no longer be a limit on the number of wage positions that seasonal employers can fill through this program. Okay, I'll take over on the last two. Um, so advanced manufacturing here, we're looking at manufacturing companies that are using innovative technologies to you know, improve competitiveness. This is not all of manufacturing, just a, a segment that has a, has a different focus. It's more innovative. And when we're talking to these companies, uh, you know, many see automation as their uh, most effective solution to labor shortage issue, issues. Uh, productivity, it's key to competitiveness in, in global markets. Automation is the best path. Uh, there are several barriers, though, to automation, including its cost, uh, the skills available in the company to implement the, the new, new technologies. And as Lana mentioned, we have smaller firm size here uh, in Atlantic Canada, which can make it more challenging. Uh, while, you know, companies realize that some of these jobs, you know, that are, uh, they can't fill may disappear uh, permanently, there are other ones that will be created due to the new technologies. Uh, there is a lot of demand for programs like ACOA's Advanced Manufacturing Technology Assessments uh, Program, which helps companies understand what's available, what are the uh, solutions that companies can use. Uh, Nova Scotia has its Innovation Rebate Program, uh, which funds investments and upgrades to equipment uh, uh, to improve productivity. So these, these types of programs, many, many of the provinces have something similar or it's focused on certain industries that are very important to just to help firms get to that next level to make that investment because there are certainly barriers. 
A second uh, piece for advanced manufacturing is labor market coordination. Uh, there is a need to improve the alignment of education programs to what the industry needs. It is a, a difficult sector to define sometimes. Uh, they do have some lower skilled advanced manufacturing occupations that could be filled by some micro-credentialing programs, uh, but there has to be some direct alignment with, uh, with companies and the education system uh, or potentially industry associations. Uh, Post-secondary education needs to better align with the, the future of advanced manufacturing, including an increased focus on automation and uh, new tech, other new technology developments. And the third piece for advanced manufacturing is international workers. Uh, firms would like more power in selecting uh, and recruiting uh, foreign candidates for senior positions, especially the, the more senior positions. Uh, talent in the region is lacking for some of these uh, high-skilled areas and uh, a little more um, ability to uh, select those types of occupations uh, would, is, would be beneficial. Uh, improve pathways for permanent residency for foreign students that continue working in the industry would also be helpful. And then digital industries, uh, it's an area uh, you know, that we've studied in the past. Uh, we define it as those that are creating and providing proprietary uh, digital technologies. The top solution there uh, is considered uh, to be international workers. Um, there's several pathways for firms to access immigrants uh, in Atlantic Canada, but awareness and resources at the firm level um, are lacking at many times. Having someone on staff who specializes in immigration uh, or accessing resources from industry associations would certainly help, but we all know that some firms are too small. They don't have the ability to do that, uh, but we, so you know, we do need to help uh, with the awareness of programs. We also have to create pathways for international students in the region to, to work with digital firms and also to assist in the relocation. Aside from that, training is seen as, uh, as very important, uh, more in-house training, continuous upscaling is going to contribute to improved skill levels uh, for employees, it'll reduce labor turnover, increasing training sessions in universities through workshops, uh, not just through the programs, but also through workshops uh, to prepare students for the digital labor market, and not just computer science graduates, but in other programs is, is important. We're starting to see that in some of the universities now, uh, mentorship programs at educational institutions as well as workshops to target soft skills are, are very important. And then the last, the non-monetary benefits are seen as an important solution. And uh, we saw that in the survey results, that's certainly an area uh, in digital industries where they feel that that's very important. They can't always compete on the wage side of things with, uh, especially with virtual working now and, and competing with companies in, in Toronto and, and Silicon Valley for workers. Um, firms do need to do adopt some more flexible work arrangements, uh, remote working, Positive work culture in the industry is all very important to retain and to attract new workers. And as employees demand uh, more work-life balances, firms are definitely going to have to adjust. Great. Well, thank you, Patrick and Lana, for kind of talking about uh, some specific uh, solutions in some of these different sectors that have different dynamics in terms of wage and skill levels and seasonality. Um, and so we are going to have a just before we close, some time for questions. So we've already got some questions uh, in the chat and just encourage you to put those in. We'll try to address as many as we can quickly. Uh, but just before we wrap up uh, on the presentation, um, just some general thoughts, uh, Patrick and Lana, just around what do businesses need to be thinking about? Uh, what should policymakers be thinking about? And what are some of the bigger, kind of broader things that uh, employers and <coughs> policymakers should be thinking about at this time? So from a, from a business perspective, uh, David, you know, short-term fixes, Band-Aid solutions, that's, that's not going to address the underlying labor issues. We do have structural issues here in Atlantic Canada that aren't going to go away. Uh, companies really need to start uh, striving to be an employer of choice, uh, improving workplace culture, work-life balance, access to training. That's all going to make them more of a, an employer of choice. Some of the old strategies are not going to work anymore. If you saw Lana's chart. Uh, back when I was coming into the workforce in the in the mid '90s, there was 20 employees for every 10 jobs, and now it's uh, there's only eight, uh, seven or eight. So you know, it's, today's employers have a smaller pool of workers. Um, they need to be more proactive. They need to up their game in order to get uh, employees in the future. They need multi-pronged strategies uh, to attract, retain, uh, and train workers with the skills that they're going to need. Initiatives to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion and reduce barriers to labor force participation are crucial to access and support uh, workers in underrepresented groups. 
and uh, investment in technology uh, for many industries, automation, digitalization, clean tech, that's going to ease labor needs and help them be more competitive, uh, especially if they're active in, in global markets. Okay, so we have three main recommendations for the public sector to help solve Atlantic Canada's labor market challenge. First, um, education and training institutions need to be responsive to the changing skill needs of this region. With ongoing shifts in occupations and skills and demand, the education sector needs to work with government and employers to develop educational and training models that are flexible and responsive to labor market needs. Number two, government must ensure that labor market policies align with current economic realities and that they maximize the supply of labor. This includes initiatives such as targeting and efficiently delivering supports to individuals, employers, and communities as the economy continues evolving, especially through some important transitions like the green economy. Um, ensuring immigration policies focus on demand and also examining the role of temporary foreign workers in meeting seasonal labor needs. Number three, government should provide reliable, timely data related to the labor market in an accessible format. Working in collaboration with Labor Market Information Council and Statistics Canada, policymakers should examine potential gaps in labor information, particularly on current and emerging skill shortages. They can also help educate employers on the demographic or other trends that are affecting the reduced labor supply. Great, that concludes our formal uh, presentation. Uh, so we do have some time for questions and we do have some questions in the chat. Um, so if you have others, I encourage you to quickly uh, put those in. We'll try to address as many as we can. Um, so one of the, we've had a few questions, Lana, just around employment insurance and how we might reform that. Uh, can you just elaborate a little more in terms of what you're suggesting in terms of kind of taking a, a closer look at EI reform as we move forward? Yeah, so we're not making um, any specific recommendations at this time. That wasn't really part of the Finding Talent series. But uh, we do need to carefully study how to maximize full year workers, especially given labor shortages. So this is an important topic to look more into. Also, we need to ensure that workers are provided for companies and that they remain competitive. Great. Um, so another question, Patrick, uh, came up for you just around the data you had on vacancies, and they were very high at the end of 2021. We were still in the kind of shutdown mode with the Omicron uh, variant there. So the question is more like how much of this is kind of a short term pandemic uh, hike in vacancies and how much of this is really a longer term uh, trend that we're seeing? Can you just kind of share your thoughts on that? Well, I think the, you know, as Lana mentioned, the underlying factors are demographic issues. So we don't expect these these issues to go away anytime soon. There is some pandemic related, uh, you know, in certain sectors uh, impact like uh, on the accommodation of food and, and tourism related industries. You know, they certainly uh, all the shutdowns that they were having during the pandemic, that's created a some, some major issues for them to bounce back. But for a lot of industries, this is gonna continue uh, going forward. We've had a, you know, a, a big influx of, of migration uh, from other provinces and immigration and still hasn't been enough to offset the, uh, the, the issues that we're having uh, on job vacancies. So uh, unfortunately, it's something that we're gonna have to deal with for a long time. Uh, and uh, you know that we, we, as I mentioned, companies are going to need to have a, a multi-pronged strategy to make sure that they can uh, encourage labor to stay and to encourage them to work for their companies. So, uh, you know, our, our numbers show that this is going to continue over the next 20 years unless we can, you know, right the ship and, and increase our population. And even you know, immigration and migration probably isn't going to be enough. Thank you, Patrick. Um, so another question, Lana, came in. Uh, you talked about uh, trying to reach out to underrepresented groups, and you talked about that specifically in some of the low-wage sectors like accommodations. So you know, the, the question is, you know, from a policy point of view, uh, is it a good strategy to encourage underrepresented groups, whether they're newcomers or Indigenous or other uh, groups that you mentioned, into some of these low, lower-wage industries? Is that just going to accentuate uh, some of the income uh, inequality issues. So any thoughts on that? Yeah, we certainly want to um, include or uh, encourage like all types of workers to um, go into these industries uh, or whatever industries that they want to of choice. So we don't necessarily want to tell um, underrepresented groups that 
this would be the, the best option for them out of like any type of industry. But we want to present to them like the opportunities that are available, especially because some of these lower wage sectors, although you might start off in a minimum wage or kind of low wage position, there are some opportunities for growth. So I think that's a really important thing to emphasize to underrepresented or any groups that might be interested in entering this type of sector. That's great. Uh, Patrick, a question for you came up was around uh, housing. Um, we talked about uh, social infrastructure and housing in particular, um, and a question just around, you know, are we doing enough to accommodate new workers? Uh, we've certainly seen an influx of people from other provinces, and that's pushed up uh, housing prices. So, uh, you know, what, what else needs to be done in terms of the housing market to ensure that workers kind of move here for some of the opportunities we're seeing? Yeah, well, I think the short answer is no, we're not doing enough at this point. Uh, you know, our housing supply is not keeping up with the pace of demand. We have <clears throat> certain provinces that have very high lofty goals for population growth, and that has to be uh, coupled with uh, a strategy to increase housing and affordable housing, especially if we're targeting, um, you know, underrepresented groups or, uh, you know, someone who's on the lower end of the wage scale that's entering the labor force. Uh, at, for the first time, uh, recent migrants uh, or immigrants uh, that are coming into low wage occupations are not going to have a chance to uh, find a place to live. That's just not that's not uh, sustainable. So we're already facing some serious challenges um, and we have to make sure that we uh, clean this up a little bit. Uh, and it's not it's not only uh, housing, it's also health care. It's also uh, infrastructure uh, to make sure that uh, people have transportation linkages all that has to be in your strategy along with growing your population. So we have to uh, we have to do more for sure to make sure that that's uh, working properly. So we're not gonna keep uh, keep those people here very long. Thank you, Pat. Lana, another question for you uh, on the role of post-secondary education. Again, you talked about underrepresented groups and newcomers and how we can kind of bring those into the labor market. Uh, the question is around the role of the post-secondary education system in helping uh, uh, either support uh, entry of uh, newcomers or underrepresented groups into the labor market. Uh, any thoughts you can share on that? Yeah, so certainly. So I think especially for newcomers who might not be familiar with our labor market or have like the connections to employers that some people who have been around for longer do, I think it's really important for um, these institutions to help them make those connections and kind of break into the market um, in like a networking sense and also to realize like what exactly is all out there if they're not really familiar with, um, with our economy and the types of opportunities that are available to them. Um, Patrick, there's a question here around the construction industry and about uh, labor mobility. Uh, we know the construction industry is very uh, mobile, uh, and the kind of question is more just around uh, you know safety training that's kind of registered or required by province, uh, and that can then be maybe an impediment because you're registered in one province but not necessarily approved to do that same work in another province. Uh, any uh, further, further thoughts just around how we improve labor mobility and uh, the labor supply in the construction sector? Yeah, I think it's going to be a, a challenge going forward. Uh, the the industry has been very mobile. It's you know one of the most mobile industries. They have to move for opportunities. We saw a huge influx of, of people into Newfoundland and Labrador and, and out again uh, during their, their surge in activity. Uh, but the labor force and construction is getting older too, and they're going to be less mobile uh, as they age. So that's something we have to think about as well. Um, there are impediments that we need to clean up for sure between uh, accreditation and getting people recognized. Uh, between provinces so we can improve the flow of uh, of, uh, of movement and mobility of of workers so there's there's more that needs to be done in that area and especially because we're facing uh you know an older population that that may be less mobile in the future so we have to find ways to get that younger labor force as mobile as possible Patrick, so Lana, a question for you on low wages. Um, you know, there's maybe a general question about, you know, why why don't we just uh, hike uh, uh, low uh, wages, particularly in those low sectors? And you talked about accommodations and fish processing in particular. Uh, we didn't have kind of increasing wages as the kind of the top strategies in those. Uh, so why uh, increasing wages in some of these low wage occupations not necessarily going to be, you know, the full answer? Any thoughts you can share? 
Sure. So, um, yeah, wage increases to a certain extent are definitely necessary since demand for workers is running high. Um, But higher wages only attract workers to your firm if they're competitive. So at some point, offering more money becomes financially challenging, especially for some of these businesses that have uh, low profit margins. And also, um, wages aren't the only thing that employees want. So I think it's important for business to keep in mind that there are non-monetary benefits that they can offer um, to become an employer of choice, such as flexible work arrangements, remote work opportunities, and uh, generous vacation policies. Great. And there's another question here around older workers. Um, I don't mind who answers that. I don't know if, Lana, you talked a bit about this uh, in one of your slides. Um, But, you know, the question is, as people hit 60 to 65, uh, any research done on how many people will stay and take on new jobs? Like, what do we see here in terms of the potential to retain older workers in the workforce? I know I have a lot of friends who still seem to be retiring at 50, 55, and not necessarily choosing to continue working full time. Uh, So any thoughts on how we address kind of older workers and their retention? Yes, absolutely. So when we did reference that 24,000, adding 24,000 employees to the workforce, if we look at seniors, that's for the category of ages between 55 and 69. Um, Looking at the data, there are a lot less workers that actually continue past the age of 70. So increasing um, the participation of seniors will definitely help with our labor force challenge, but we do need to look to all potential pools of labor to generate positive long-term change to the structure of the labor market. And also another important point is that many seniors do only choose to work part-time past their typical retirement age. Got time for maybe one more question. Uh, Patrick, uh, you talked uh, just about how you know the role, the vacancy rates in rural areas are much higher or are higher than in some of the cities, which is maybe surprising uh, given that typically they've got higher unemployment rates. Can you just help us understand kind of what's going on on that kind of geographic uh, basis? Yeah, well, I think a lot of it ties back to what I talked about uh, in the higher rates of seasonal employment. There are some strong links between uh, the higher rates of seasonal employment and employment insurance uh, use in, in more rural regions. Um, there's a, sometimes a mismatch of skills between uh, the types of work and the compensation that workers are offering and, and what uh, workers want. So, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a few factors around, you know, the seasonal seasonality, the EI use that, that really we, we can point to as a, as a major factor and why even though we see some higher unemployment rates, uh, they're, they're not willing to uh, um, you know, take some of the jobs that are there just because there is some reliance on, on EI. Uh, so that's why, you know, we think we do have to look at the, the structure of, uh, of the EI system and try to get more of those people, uh, whether it's through training or other measures, to get them uh, into full-time employment. That would make a big difference in terms of our uh, overall labor force. That's great. So thank you, Lana, and thank you, Patrick, uh, very much for taking the time to share some of our research and findings we've been doing on some of these specific sectors, as well as on labor markets more generally. I'd like to thank you all for your questions. We are at time. I know there's a couple we didn't get to, uh, but thank you very much for participating in our polls and uh, in the Q&A session. Uh, We will be putting the link to the evaluation in the chat, so if you can do that, we'll also email that out. It will only take about 30 seconds, so we do encourage you to do that. Uh, So again, thank you for joining us. And just a reminder that our major projects event uh, is coming up. Uh, There will also be some further research that we'll be releasing on those specific sectors that we've talked about. Um, But our major projects is our next webinar session at the end of May and beginning of June. So we do encourage you to register for that. So thank you very much for joining us today. And we really appreciate your time. Thank you.